cross you came and broke them down you broke them down and there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is great shaking all the dead are coming back to life i'm back to life and hear the song awaken all creation singing we're alive cause you're alive you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive
is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh 
come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. For the stand before the throne. our heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, uh, we just want to thank you this morning, Lord, and we just want to praise you and, um, and lift our voices to you, God, and uh, with all of our songs, we just want to make sure that, um, that we're just singing uh, straight to you and for your glory and, uh, and your praise, Lord, and uh, we just want to remember your son Jesus this morning, God, and his sacrifice that he made, and just want to continue to keep that at the forefront of our minds uh, throughout this time, God. Um, and this morning, Lord, um, I just want to continue to pray for community in a time when we're separated, Lord, um, and just that we can keep seeing um, how we're still connected with one another, God, and uh, that you can just help us to find those uh, community aspects. And uh, Lord, I just pray that this morning you would just help to bring us clarity and bring us some peace um, and to just give us a message that we really need and just some words that we needed to hear, God, and we pray that you would do that um, and that you would just continue to provide and to just be there and um, and that your will would be done on this earth, Lord. And it's just in your name that we pray this morning. Amen. Well, hey, guys. Uh, welcome to Church Online yet again as we continue to provide online gatherings for our church family and friends. Again, it's just so great to be with you and with so many who are joining in um, from all over the place. Um, welcome. We're so glad to be with you today. Um, for those of you who watched last week or you uh, subscribe to my e-news, which is just a regular email update about all things that go on here at the church, um, you know that last week um, I made an announcement that we are going to be moving forward with voting on a name change here at the church from Christ's Church of the Meadows to Refinery Church. And I, I hope you had a chance to take a look at our website and you can catch the details about so many things related to that on the website. Um, that would include things like who is eligible to vote and, and how we're going to do this voting in the midst of this whole COVID-19 deal and, and when we're going to be voting, which by the way, it will open August the 9th will be our first time voting. Um, we're going to hold a selfish potluck um, to sort of kick that off, an opportunity to get together with, with some folks here um, with social distancing and such. But um, uh, we invite you to that selfish pot. We're calling it selfish potluck because it's like just bring food for yourself, not to share with everybody else, right? So hopefully, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but you can look at the details as to when we're voting um, online there. And then, of course, why we are seeking a name change, which is a huge thing. And, and I hope that you're starting to catch some of that or, or maybe it's just being refreshed now because we've talked about it several months ago. But this is all tied to our mission as a church. 
Um, we want to win people to Jesus Christ. That's what we're about as a church family. And, and the feedback that we've received on this name change, I mean, from, from non-church goers to um, various churches in North America who um, are using the name Refinery in their church name. I mean, we just believe that Refinery Church, it's a helpful name in, in helping us to reach out to people who are far from God. And that's really what we're all about. It's a unique name, absolutely. But it also, um, it opens up some um, avenues of discussion. And so we're excited about that. We're excited to talk about our church. We want to talk about the amazing things that, that God is doing in and through our church family. And, and that name change helps to open that up a little bit. Um, and so the staff and the leadership here, we're, we're very excited to, to move forward with this name change. And, and, and through much prayer and, and through a great deal of discussion, we believe that this is where God is leading our church family. Um, and so on August 9th, we're going to start. That's uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, that Sunday, I'm actually going to devote the message to giving some more detail about the vision for this name change for those who um, haven't heard or would like some more detail. And also, again, just refreshing what we talked about many, many months ago. So, But until then... I, I prayerfully hope that, that we can move in this direction together. I hope that this is something that our entire church family can, can move forward in the same direction together. Um, an exciting, uh, fresh start for our church family as we seek to point more people to the person of Jesus Christ. So that's something to look forward to in the next few weeks here. But today, we're in part three of uh, this series that we're going through right now. It's called It's Personal. And uh, we're going to wrap that up next Sunday, but um, I'm so glad that you're here today because I think today's message uh, has tremendous um, opportunity to, to be very impactful for so many of us. So I'm glad that you're, you're here today. I'll tell you, my desire throughout this series, and I've put that out there many times, but it's for those of you who have any, any questions or maybe you have obstacles um, or past hurts or experiences with church or with Christians or whatever, I, I want you to know that there is a way around those things for you to be able to come to know the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I've said several times since we started this series a couple of weeks back that, that adults largely do not become Christians because they simply get all of their questions answered. And you have some very um, likely questions, some very important sorts of questions and that. But adults largely don't become Christians because they get all of their questions answered. Um, and all of their obstacles removed or addressed, they become Christians when, when something happens that makes it very personal for them. And in time, some of those questions do get answered, and, and some of those obstacles do get removed, but, but some of those questions never get answered. And some of those obstacles, they, they, they never get removed. But, and, and it's not because it, you know, all the tension is going to get resolved for you, because some of it will not. But, but something comes along that makes it intensely personal and very real, and it sort of shrinks those questions. It shrinks those obstacles. Something comes along that makes God, that makes Christianity, that makes faith just so much more personal, because that's what Jesus is all about. Now, I want to try to illustrate that today, and, and you've noticed I'm, I'm sitting in a comfy chair. We've changed venues. I'm in what some people call at our church the green room, and uh, you know, I, I, I've always referred to it as the Edmonton room for some reason, or the YEG room, Y-E-G, you know, as the Edmonton uh, tagline. But uh, I, I'm here in another part of our building. We thought we'd change things up a little bit. I got the comfy chair going, which is probably what you're sitting in right now. It's what I sit in on Sunday mornings is a comfy sofa to watch our services and to engage with the online. Um, but I want to give you a sports illustration. I'm excited because I love sports. Um, and so I'm excited because sports are starting to move forward again. And and right or wrong, I'm just excited to be able to watch some hockey um, and some other sports that are going to be on TV. But the illustration I want to give you today is a baseball illustration. And I'm going to put some figures up. And I don't have the screen with me today. So what I'm going to do is just hold a card up here. And this card is going to lay out some details about how a person hits a 90 mile an hour fastball. So if you're not a baseball person, what you need to understand is that those pitchers can throw the ball really fast. And 90 mile an hour is a pretty good fastball, but it, that's not even hitting peak, um, 
peak speed for a fastball. But here's some details about hitting a 90 mile an hour fastball. So I hope that you can see that from where you're sitting, but I'm gonna walk through this a little bit here. There, there's a guy who's a professor at Yale University. His name is Robert Adair. And, and he's one of the professors there who, who studied the science behind um, Major League Baseball and the ability to hit a fastball. And he went with a 90 mile an hour fastball. And, and so what he discovered is that a 90 mile an hour fastball, um, it, it, it takes 400 milliseconds to travel 60 and a half feet. Now that's the distance from the pitcher's mound to the plate where the batter is standing. So the distance between when that pitcher lets go of the ball and it's arrived at the plate, that's 60.5 feet. And, and it, takes 400, it takes less than half a second for the ball to travel that distance. Now, here's, here's what he also discovered in all of his research, is that half of that flight time, 200 milliseconds, okay? So you can see it here, hopefully. Uh, 200 milliseconds is spent by the batter trying to just find the ball in the air, because you can imagine that thing coming at you real fast, and then to decide whether or not he's going to swing at it. So you're just trying to identify where is that ball and am I going to swing? That takes 200 milliseconds. Um, if the batter decides that he's going to swing, then the brain takes another 100 milliseconds to, to decide on the placement of that swing. So am I going to swing kind of high? Am I going to swing right in the middle? Am I going to come a little bit underneath the ball? Am I swinging a little bit outside into the strike zone there? Or am I going to kind of tuck it in a little bit? That placement of where your swing is going to go, that's another 100 milliseconds. Um, now the swing itself then takes 150 milliseconds. But during the first 50 milliseconds of that, that batter can stop the swing. So if he decides partway through, nope, I'm going to, you got that 50 millisecond, <laughs> which is a nothing period of time to decide, okay, I'm not going to follow through here. And after that, you're committed to swinging. But he also found this professor, Adair, he discovered that a seven millisecond difference, a variance of, of some sort in there, seven milliseconds one way or the other, will cause the batter to hit that ball foul. So it's, it's, it's not a playable ball. Um, or miss that ball altogether. Seven milliseconds, it's crazy. So what he concluded from his research is that hitting a 90 mile an hour fastball is actually impossible. He determined that mathematically speaking, it's impossible because it takes 450 milliseconds to for the batter to find the ball, to decide whether he's going to swing, to decide where he's going to place that bat swing and where it's going to go. And it takes 450 milliseconds, but it's all, the ball is already there in 400 milliseconds. So mathematically speaking, this physicist has determined that it is impossible for somebody to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball. Now, I would bet that there's none of us who are sitting here today who would say, well, you know what, uh, right here, he's wrong here, and, and he's a little bit off here, and, and this calculation. I don't think any of us would sit here and say, um, you know, here's the places where I think he's wrong. We would say, I saw it happen. <laughs> we would say, I can't, I, I can't argue maybe with his facts and all the math in all of this, but I don't really subscribe to that theory because I've seen it happen. Some of you might have watched some baseball last night and you watched hitters hitting the ball. <laughs> I've not just seen a 90 mile an hour fastball hit. I've seen a 95 mile an hour or even faster where they've hit at that. And, and the science may say that this looks impossible, but none of us believe that it's impossible. Why? Because we are smart enough as individuals not to opt for the unexplainable <laughs> over the undeniable, which is we've seen somebody do it. Hitting a 90 or 95 five mile an hour fastball would appear to be unexplainable with the math and the physics involved, but it's not undeniable because we see it happen all the time when Major League Baseball is played. And, and it's not just by one guy. It's not that there's only one player who can do this. There's multiple players who can do it, and they're able to do it all the time. And so in this realm of life, we're smart enough to know that I'm not going to opt for the unexplainable because of what is undeniable. You tracking with me on that? Hopefully. Here's the deal. In, in every area of life, we, we do this. 
we do this thing. We opt for the undeniable over the unexplainable. Um, the, the first time I got this little, I don't know if you can see, I've got this little piece of plastic that's strapped to my ear, right? That's the microphone, right? So I got this little piece of, the, the first time that I, I put that on, I didn't say, wait a minute, before I do that, before I attach this thing to my ear and, and talk through that tiny little end of it there, uh, somebody needs to explain to me exactly how this all works. Give me the science behind it. I need to know exactly the details of all. No, I just, I put the thing on and I tried it because I'd seen it being done before. I've seen people use these types of microphones before, and, and the truth is, is I'm not really interested in an explanation, right? Um, because we live in a world where we say lots. Look, if it works, then count me in. If it works, then, then I'm in. I, I really don't need a full explanation of how it all works. And in just about every realm of life, we, we do this kind of thing all the time. Parents, if, if I gave you a book and I said, look, if you read this book and do the things that are in this book, your kids are just going to turn out great. It's going to be wonderful for them. You wouldn't be real interested in the full explanation behind it all. But if a thousand parents simply read that book and they started to and you saw and they said, hey, it works for us. We tried it. We read the book and we applied the principles and stuff it works, then you would be in because it works. And we really don't care why half the time. Now, that's not to discount the unexplainable. And this message and what we're talking about here today, it, it's not to discount the importance of your questions. It's none of that. But here's what I do want you to hear today. There is an avenue, there is a path for you to come to God and to Christianity that takes you around your obstacles rather than directly through them or over them or whatever the case may be. And I want to describe that for you today because there's a way that adults become followers of Jesus Christ without getting all of their questions answered up front. Um, and as much as that may seem to be to you maybe a bit of a slap in the face to your intellect or something like that, um, we do this all of the time in, in all kinds of areas of life. I mean, if you're like me, um, I watch airplanes take off. My house happens to be right on a flight path, and so I see those planes all the time coming and going out of the Edmonton airport here. And I'll watch those planes take off, and, and, and I think, man, how on earth do they get something so big and something so heavy flying through the air like that? It's absolutely amazing to me. I do not understand how they do it. I don't understand the science and the engineering and the physics behind all of that. But I've never met anybody who would say, you know what, I'm not going to get into that airplane until I fully understand how this works and all the principles behind how they can get that, that heavy bird up in the sky like that. Why? Because it's undeniable, because it works, because we know that it's able to, to, to get off the ground, we know that it flies through the air. Is the unexplainable important? Yes, but practically speaking, we are willing, oftentimes, not to allow the unexplainable to overshadow what is undeniable. When it, when it comes to Christianity, most, most adults become followers of Jesus Christ because something happens that makes it so personal for them. I just feel like I keep repeating myself on this, but for good reason. Something happens that it just makes it so personal for people that the reality of Christianity becomes so undeniable that that individual is where, willing to carry some things with them into a relationship with Jesus Christ that they would admit, this is sort of unexplainable to me, but this is absolutely undeniable to me. And, and here's the other side of the equation too, is, is so many adults who become followers of Jesus Christ with all of their questions, with all of their obstacles, over time they would say that many of the things that seem to be today unexplainable become a little more explainable over time. They don't all remain unexplainable. Now, today, I, I, what I want to do is I want to share with you um, what I think is kind of a funny story in the Bible. Um, and, and this is the kind of story where, where I, I can sort of picture Jesus and, and his closest friends and followers sitting around sometime and just kind of reminiscing and somebody brings this up and, hey, do you remember that time when? And this is the kind of story that would be told in that environment because it is kind of a funny story. But it's a story that really illustrates what happens when a person says, oh, you know what, I'm not going to allow the un undeniable to guide my life. I mean, something might be undeniable, but that's not going to guide my life. I am going to ignore what is undeniable until I fully understand everything that has to do with it. Until I have all of the answers, until it's fully explained, I'm going to shelf what is undeniable. Um, it, it, I'll tell you... It, 
if that describes you, when you stay in that mode, at some point, honestly, it becomes just a little absurd. And, and that's our story here today. And so I want to read this story for you here. Um, this is from uh, the Bible book of John, which is written by John, chapter 9. So you can pull it up on your version Bible app or grab your paper copy of the Bible, whatever you use. Um, John chapter 9 is where we're going to be at. And we're going to sort of walk through the, the whole chapter here. It's a fascinating story. Here's how it reads. As Jesus went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples said to him, Rabbi, which is just a Jewish word for teacher. They said, teacher, Rabbi, Jesus, who sinned? <coughs> was it this man, this blind man, or was it his parents? Because he's been born blind. See, in, in that day and age, and maybe somewhat in our day and age today, people thought that if something bad was happening in your life, it was because you'd sinned. Or it was because your parents had sinned, or maybe even the grandparents. Somebody along the way had done something wrong, and this was sort of payback, if you will. It was God's way of kind of, okay, you're going to sin, then this is going to happen, and smite button or whatever takes place, right? And, and Jesus comes along, and his disciples, this, is, this was their mindset. And so they're looking at this man who had been born blind, and they say to Jesus, so Jesus, what, what happened here? Was it this man, was it his sin that caused this, or was it his parents, or what? Can you tell us how this works? And Jesus wants to clarify this whole scenario, and he's going to explain what God was like. And, and, and here's some uninformed guys um, who figured that somebody had sinned in order that this man had been born blind. And so Jesus says this. He says, well, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It's sort of like Jesus is saying, you guys, you know what? This is, this is kind of the wrong question. <laughs> And we've got these kinds of things that go on in our life today. I mean, these either or kinds of things. It's like, hey, God, you know, conservative or liberal or, you know, whatever it might be. And, the, and, and Jesus is saying, guys, I know that this question is important to you or it makes some sense to you, but, but this isn't really what it's about. In fact, you're asking the wrong question here. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It's, it's not about that at all. But then he says this, but this has happened so that the work of God might be displayed in this man's life. Okay, Jesus, that's a little hard to swallow, right? Jesus, what you're saying is that this guy has spent his life blind so that the work of God might be displayed in his life? Jesus says, yeah, that's exactly what it is. But, but Jesus, I'm not really comfortable with that. <laughs> but guys, or gal, that's how it is. That's a, he's not blind because of his parents. He's not blind because of his sin or anybody's sin for that matter. He says this, Jesus, this man is blind so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And then he goes on, Jesus says, listen, as long as it's day, we must do the work of the one who sent me. And I'm sure Jesus' disciples at that point are going, okay, hang on, Jesus, weren't we just talking about this blind man here? Like, stay on track, Jesus, you kind of, where are we going with this? Jesus continues, he says, night is coming when no one can work. And then he makes this amazing statement. While I'm in this world, I am the light of this world. Let me try to make some sense of what Jesus is saying here to those guys and to us here today. What Jesus is saying is, he's saying, look, until I got here, until I came to earth here, or my Father God sent me, there was confusion about God, about how he works, about who he is, and I'm here to clear up the confusion. And, and Jesus is saying, guys, y you need to pay attention here because I'm going to be leaving. I'm not staying here forever. I'm going to be leaving to prepare a place for you in heaven. And when I leave, things are going to get a little dark here again on this planet Earth. They're going to get a little bit confusing. And, and just as there, con there is confusion about God right now, case in point, you guys think because something bad has happened to somebody that it's because of their sin or it's because of the sin of their parents or something. Jesus is saying, look, if you th w when I leave, the confusion about God is going to increase over time. It's going to increase all over this Earth. We see it all over the place today in our world, don't we? So he says, guys, I need you to pay attention. <laughs> and the story goes on. He says, having said this, and here's where it gets a little gross, Jesus spit on the ground and he made some mud with his saliva and the dirt. I mean, that's just absolutely gross. And then he put it on the blind man's eyes. Pause and think about that one for just a moment. <laughs> if you were that guy, it's like, ugh. And then he said this. He says, go. Go. 
he told the blind man, and wash in the pool of Siloam, which was a well-known place. That word means scent. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and he washed the mud and off his eyes and, and he came home seeing. He's healed. This man who has never been able to see his entire life, all of a sudden, can see. And this is where the story kind of picks up some steam here. This is where it kind of gets interesting. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging as a blind man, they asked, well, wait a minute. Isn't this the same man who used to sit out and, and, on, on the street and beg? And some claimed that he was. And others said, no, no, that guy only looks like him. <laughs> Why? Because none of this made any sense to them. It was all very unexplainable, right? <laughs> We've seen this guy who's been sitting here daily and has been begging for years and we know he's blind. And all of a sudden, that guy goes walking by and, and he can see where he's going. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. There's no explanation for this. Check this out. <laughs> but the man, the blind man himself insisted, I am the guy because they're like, is that the guy? No, he can't be. He's just, it's his doppelganger, right? Like, and he's like, no, I'm the guy. <laughs> and they demanded an answer. Well, how then are your eyes opened? Because we want an explanation, don't we? Don't you want an explanation for things? Don't you have questions that you demand an answer to? It's a fair question. And he replied, well, the man they called Jesus, he made some mud, and he probably didn't know how it was made until maybe somebody told him afterwards, but he made some mud, he put it on my eyes, he told me to go to Siloam and wash it off, I went and washed, and then I could see. (laughs) And the people around were like, no, 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 no. What else you got? I mean, give me something. I need a better explanation. I need an explanation that actually makes sense. Give me something else. And they asked him actually a very funny question. They said, well, where is this man? <laughs> and he's like, well, I don't know. I didn't see where he went, right? Like, first I'm blind and he put the mud pack on my eyes. I didn't see where he went. I just went to the pool and washed that off. So they brought to the Pharisees this man who had been born blind. The Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day. And, and this is what you're supposed to do when a miracle happens, is you take that person to whom it happened, you go to the Pharisees. The Pharisees had the task of figuring out who the Messiah was. Because they are waiting. They're waiting for somebody to come along. It had been prophesied for hundreds of years that somebody was going to come to redeem the people of Israel. And, and they're waiting. And so the Pharisees are going to identify who this Messiah is. And, 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 and miracles. I mean, that was like something that the Messiah would do. So you bring this to the Pharisees. So here we go. Now on the day which Jesus had made the mud and opened up the, eye, the, the man's eyes, that day was a Sabbath. The Jewish law said you can't work on a Sabbath, and you you can't do a whole lot of anything. I mean, you kind of just sat still, and you you just obeyed the law, which was do nothing on the Sabbath. And so they're like, well, Jesus, don't you know that you can't work on the Sabbath? And so this is a really, really big deal for these guys. So therefore, the Pharisees also asked this man, who had now been brought to them, how did he receive his sight? And the man's, here's his answer yet again. He put some mud on my eyes, the man replied. I went and washed it off, and now I see. <laughs> and some of the Pharisees at that point said, well, this man, Jesus, he's not from God because he doesn't even keep the Sabbath. <laughs> so it's like Jesus doesn't keep the rules, so he can't possibly be from God. At this point, this story is about to spiral into some of the most absurd dialogue in the Bible. But here's where it's very, very relevant for you, and it's very relevant for me. See, all of us have this God box. You've got one, I've got We all have this God box. We've got a God box that says, um, here's how God works. Here's how God operates. And therefore, here's how I pray for example. Or you've got a God box that says, you know what, here's how I think God is supposed to work. Here's how I think God ought to be working. And because he doesn't, well, then I guess there's no God, right? That's maybe your God box. We all have one. The Pharisees had one, these religious leaders. (coughs) Their God box said, here's how God works, and here's what God does. And God would never, ever do work on a Sabbath. God would never, ever even perform a miracle on a Sabbath. And since that is our worldview, since that's our worldview, our God box, then it is absolutely unexplainable how this blind man could be healed by God because God would never do that on the Sabbath. <clears throat> Let me carry on here. <clears throat> Some of the Pharisees said, 
well, this man's not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath, right? But others were asking, well, how is it that then a sinner can do such miraculous signs? That's another good question, isn't it? And so they were divided on this. You Pharisees, you might not be able to explain it all, but what's undeniable is that a blind man can now see. So, so, so what are we going to do, Pharisees? What are we going to do, people? Uh, I mean, which way are we going to go? Yes, it's unexplainable. I mean, this guy's supposed to be blind, but it's also undeniable that the blind man can now see. So what are we going to do with this? This is finally great. Finally, they turned again to the blind man, and they said, well, what do you have to say about him, about Jesus? I mean, it was your eyes that he opened. <laughs> I, this is sort of like a game show. Are you smarter than a Pharisee, right? Like, I mean, it's just crazy. They turn to the guy and they say, well, you tell us again what happened and who this man is. And he's like, what? I just told you guys. Like, what is going on here? And they're like, well, yeah, but we need you to explain it to us. We need you to tell us in a way that fits within our worldview. <laughs> we need you to give us explanation that fits within the God box that we have. And so he looks at them and he says, I, I, I don't know, he's a prophet? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what to say to you guys anymore. I've told you, you just don't like my explanation. It doesn't fit what you want to hear. It doesn't fit your worldview. And the story continues. The Jews still did not believe that he had even been born blind and that he had received his sight. And so they sent for the man's parents. <laughs> Now, why did they not believe that he had been born blind? Because what's taken place doesn't fit with their worldview of God. So they're just throwing the whole thing out. It doesn't make sense, so I'm going to get rid of it. it. It doesn't make sense according to the way that they saw the world, according to the way that maybe you see the world. or so, And it's like, so we're going to just cast it aside. It's just sort of absurd. But this is what happens to any of us who opt for the unexplained over the undeniable. You've got a God box. <clears throat> and, and maybe your God box is that you don't even think he's there because he doesn't operate, he's not working the way that you want him to, the way that you think he hasn't answered prayers, the way that he's supposed to in your mind and all this stuff, or he's not personal, or, or whatever it might be for you. I don't know. But the thing that I want to challenge you on today as you're watching this and as we're going through this today is would you be willing to, to acknowledge that maybe your worldview or your God box that maybe, including your view on God, that it might be wrong. That maybe the way that you've looked at this for so long, maybe it's not the right way of looking at it. <laughs> and there's this tension in you that this Jesus thing is kind of undeniable, but I can't explain it. <laughs> Could it be that maybe you've been approaching it wrong? That's kind of hard to admit, isn't it? That's where the Pharisees were at. And so the Pharisees sent for this guy's parents. Here's how the story reads, continues on. Parents show up. Is this your son, they ask? Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it that he now can see? So now they're asking the parents. Well, the parents answered, we know that he's our son, of course. I mean, that's our son standing right there. We know that he was born blind. That we can confirm. That boy has been blind since the day he was born, and, and that's been his life ever since. But how he can see now? Or who opened his eyes so that he can see? Well, we, we don't know. We weren't there. Why don't you ask him? I mean, he's of age. He'll speak for himself. I mean, this is getting crazy, right? But his parents said this because they were afraid of these Jewish men. Because already these Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put right out of the synagogue. That was a big deal for these Jewish people. They're going to put you out of the synagogue. They, they had already made a worldview decision. They were already locked and loaded as to what their God box was all about. And if the information didn't fit their view, if what was undeniable didn't fit within their worldview, they didn't care. The Jesus case was open and shut for them. I mean, any explanation that included Jesus, that was not acceptable. They'd shut the door on Jesus as an explanation. Now, let me push you just a little bit, okay, if you're viewing this right now. Some of you were raised in homes where the God explanation or the Jesus explanation or the faith explanation, that wasn't allowed in your home. That wasn't a part of the worldview that went on around the dinner table in your house. And so you grew up, and as you became an adult, you kind of inherited some of that skepticism about God, about faith, about Christianity, about the church. And, and there are things that have come along in your life, and, and you've tried to explain things outside of the realm of God, 
outside of the explanation of God because in your mind, you just don't factor that in. That was the Pharisees, right? They just don't factor that in. And, and maybe you've worked very diligently in your life to explain away miraculous things that you've seen happen um, or heart change in people that you're close to or maybe yourself and all of that kind of thing. Um, because according to your worldview, that doesn't make sense, the God explanation. But could it be that there are things that are undeniably true? Could it be that, that your heavenly Father would like to open your worldview a little bit, would like to open up your God box a little bit because it's been closed in a way that maybe narrowed things down too much. And maybe, maybe it is that your heavenly father would like to show you how much bigger and how much um, more personal he truly is. And it doesn't discount the importance of the questions that you might have. Um, It's a fair question to ask, how does this happen? How did that happen? But I'll tell you what, when the person you were asking gives you the explanation as we're reading through this story. At some point, you just got to decide, am I going to go with the explanation or am I just going to discount the explanation altogether because it simply doesn't fit my worldview? The story continues. This is why his parents said, well, our son, he's of age. You just go ask him. (laughs) A second time, they called in the boy who had been born blind and they said, we need you to give glory to God now. (laughs) We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner because he healed somebody. He did work on the Sabbath day. So the Pharisees are saying, listen, um, previously blind men, we're going to give you one more chance to answer this question, but we need you to give glory to God in your answer this time. Make your answer fit our box. (laughs) Because we know that this man, Jesus, well, he's a sinner. (laughs) He did work on the Sabbath. So the, the man who was previously blind, here's his response. He says, well, guys, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I don't really know that. But one thing I do know, I was blind, and now I can see. <laughs> that is undeniable, even if you don't like my explanation. I was blind, but now I see. You don't like my explanation because it doesn't fit your worldview, But could we maybe celebrate things a little bit here? Because rather than spending the entire day focusing on why my explanation doesn't fit inside your box, could we celebrate what's undeniable that I can now see? (laughs) I mean, you guys are the religious leaders, right? I mean, aren't you the ones who should be going, you know what, only God could do something like this. (laughs) And so they said to him, they said, well, what did he do to you, this man Jesus how did he open your eyes? I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me? They're asking the same questions over and over. And he answered, I've told you guys already, and you didn't listen. <laughs> Why do you want to hear it again? And then he throws this little jab in. He says, do you guys want to become his disciples too? <laughs> it's just hilarious. So then they hurled insults at them. These are the religious leaders. They hurled insults at the man, and they said, well, you're this fellow's disciple. We are disciples. We're followers of Moses. Because we know that God spoke to Moses. Which is like, okay, just big time out here, religious guys. How do you know that God spoke to Moses? Were you there hundreds of years ago when he actually spoke to Moses? You're you're so confident that God spoke to Moses. And the reason that you're confident is because your parents told you that's what happened. And so that's your worldview. And so you've determined what the God box looks like and you've determined your worldview because that's the story that you were told and you believe that God spoke to Moses. Why? By faith. Because you trust. Because that's what you've put your confidence in. Now, why can you not acknowledge what's happening right in your midst, what is completely undeniable, even if you don't like the explanation? They, they, they go on with this. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. <laughs> and the man answered them, well, that's remarkable, you religious guys. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He just continues on. And that was his God box. That was the, that previously blind man's God box. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, he says. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man, Jesus, were not from God, then I think he could do nothing. And to this, the religious leaders, the Pharisees replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. Now they're ticked at him. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? (laughs) And they threw him out. (laughs) I mean, it's just, just the craziest story ever. They threw him out of the synagogue. Which to us doesn't mean a whole lot, but in that day, in their culture, it meant everything. 
It meant that he could no longer participate in the temple sacrifice, which was a big deal. He would no longer have atonement for his sin, be made right uh, with God, uh, with, uh, with regards to his sin. He wouldn't be able to get certain jobs because he was no longer a part of the synagogue worship. He would be considered unclean for the rest of his life because he'd been tossed out of the synagogue worship. This all took place on the day that God gave him his sight. Story goes on. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found the man, which means Jesus went out to look for him, He said, listen, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the Son of Man was just terminology that Jesus used to describe himself. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And don't you think that that man would have recognized Jesus' voice? I mean, he was blind when Jesus was talking to him previously, but he would have recognized the voice. And and Jesus comes to him now and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And this blind man who now can see, he says, "Well, well, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I might believe in him. I'm thinking, you're the guy who put that mud on my eyes. So listen, whatever you say, I'm going with you, all right? I I trust you. I believe in you. I'm putting my faith in you. And Jesus said, listen, you've now seen him. In fact, he says, he's the one who's speaking with you. In other words, I'm the guy. I'm the one. And this man now is seeing Jesus for the first time. And he says this, he says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And I'll tell you what, you and I, we would have done the exact same thing too. Maybe, maybe every once in a while you want to ask, you know, do, do you ever doubt? Do you ever doubt? Let, let, let me tell you about when we doubt. We doubt when we get all focused on what is unexplainable and we lose sight of what is undeniable. We, we doubt when we forget the things that God has done and we begin to focus on the things that he has not done for us yet we doubt when we lose sight of the things that we have experienced and the things that we have seen and the things that we have read and we start saying things like god you're not acting the way that i think you ought to god you're not answering prayers the way that i need you to or the way that i think you're supposed to we doubt when we get all fixated on the unexplainable and we lose sight of what is undeniable and yet in every other area of life we make decisions based on what is undeniable, not what is unexplainable. You know, some, someone could explain how a major league batter could hit a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. Somebody could come along. There's an explanation because it takes place, right? I don't know what it is because the math doesn't add up. The physics of it all don't add up. But I opt for the undeniable because I see it happen all the time. All of the things that are so perplexing to us in life, and you've got your questions and whatever that might... There's explanation... We just often don't know what the explanation is. The thing that, that, that God does in the heart of an adult through, through experience or, or through time or, or through something that you read, at some point God brings us to the point where, 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 where we understand this and we begin to apply this to our lives, um, what we already apply in other areas of our life. Because here's what's undeniable. 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago, This guy shows up on planet Earth, and he shows up in Palestine, of all places, and he's the son of a carpenter. And he has this, what what, what so many in that day would have considered a totally irrelevant message, and maybe you would consider it to be a totally irrelevant message today. Here was his message. He said, love your neighbor and pray for those who hate you. That was his message. (laughs) And on top of that, this same man, Jesus, He makes these outlandish claims. He says, I am the light of the world. And he says, nobody can come to God, my Father, except through me. (laughs) I mean, that message never should have made it out of the first century. (laughs) Right? It should have died on the spot. (laughs) But then Jesus did something else. He said this. He says, listen, guys. He says, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to raise myself from the dead. And he did. And hundreds and hundreds of people were eyewitness to it. And they said, listen, we're we're witnesses to this fact. It's undeniable. And then those same hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, they gave their lives, not for something that they believed, but for something that they saw that was undeniable. They saw a dead man raised to life. And today... 
uh, whatever day you're watching this, uh, on every continent of our world, there are men <coughs> and there are women who will tell you that they have had a personal interaction with God through Jesus Christ, and their stories would sound eerily familiar to the same stories that we hear right here in Edmonton. What is undeniable is the people around the world who should have never heard the story because it never should have got out of the first century. They've embraced God as their heavenly father because Jesus invited them as he invites you to do so. And they've embraced Jesus as their personal savior because that's who he said he was. And their hearts and their lives and their relationships have been radically changed for the better. You know what else is undeniable? There, there's a hole in your heart that, that money and people and stuff cannot fill. And you can keep swapping in and swapping out people, and you can keep swapping in and swapping out stuff and things and all kinds of... But at some point, as you're laying there looking at the ceiling at night, or, or you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you begin to realize, you know what, this ain't working for me. And when you look for what might be out there, and if you get all hung up with the unexplainable... And it's all, well, it's just a category and it's just, it's just religion or it's just God or it's just Jesus or it's just Christianity and it's just, well, who's right and how do they know and all. But there's a hole in your heart because God looked at our world and he looked at your situation and my situation and he saw your sin and my sin and the sin of our world and he decided he's not going to hold a Q&A session to address all of those things that you might question he decided to do the most personal thing that he could he sent his son into this world so that his son jesus could reflect what god the father is like jesus said it all the time if you've seen me you've seen the father and he did this so that he could take on your two biggest problems which is sin and death sin and death and he said listen i'll handle those i got them and if people want to come to me so that I can take care of that stuff, then you come on my terms, God says. And he says, my terms are not categorical, and they're not intellectual. My terms are personal, because I want a personal relationship with you, he says. So what I hope we've been able to do here today is to show you that there is an avenue for you to be able to pack your questions and to pack your, your obstacles and put those things on your back, and you can still become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you will simply opt for what is undeniable and not live in the shadow of what is sometimes unexplainable. And if you listen to all of this and you still got both feet firmly pushed hard onto the brake pedal, I mean, would you do what I've kind of challenged or asked you to do for the last couple of weeks here? Would you pray a very simple prayer? Would you say, God, listen, if you can be known, then I want to know you more than I want to know the answers to all of my questions. I want to know you, God, more than I want to know the answers to all of my questions. And then there are others of you who are watching here today, and, and let's be honest, okay? You have heard enough. <laughs> you know that there's something undeniable. And you still have some questions, but I want to challenge you to cross the line of faith, to take that step towards God and to entering a relationship with Him, and to say, Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your Son Jesus to be my personal Savior. I believe that he died for my sin, and I believe that if I place my trust in you, that you will accept me as your son or as your daughter. (laughs) Many of you have heard enough that you can make that decision. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that as I close in prayer right now. Let's do that. Father God, I just want to take a moment and pray here. And, and, And there are some here watching today who are ready to say yes to you, God that have heard enough that that they understand what is absolutely undeniable. And yeah, there's still maybe some questions. Maybe there's still some some obstacles. but, But there's this undeniable aspect of you, God. And it's time to step in that direction. And so for those who, who th- they're ready to do that, God, maybe you can just pray along with me right now, just silently in your hearts, or maybe you're in your living room and you want to pray out loud to God, just go ahead and do so. But God... We want to admit that, yes, I'm a sinner and that I've kind of been going my own way and that it's time for me to start going your way. And I see what is undeniable and I can see the, the leadership that you have and, and, and provide for my life and, and I want to be a part of that and I want to have you a part of my life, God. And I want to stop doing life my way and all about me and I want to turn and start living my life your way, God. I want to come to you on your terms. I want to come humbly, 
I want to come just trusting you, God, putting my faith in you. And God, I want to acknowledge that, that yeah, I've been doing my own thing, but I, I accept the work of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross that day when he died for me to pay the price once and for all for my sin. God, I thank you for that, and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And listen, if that's your prayer today, I, I want to celebrate that with you. We want to celebrate that. Would you tell somebody who you're sitting with or, or maybe give somebody a phone call, phone the church office. We want to celebrate with you. We want to help you follow up and take next steps. God, would you, would you challenge and encourage us to do that? Would this be a day of celebration, God, as people come to faith in you? That's our prayer. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.